Hey, I just want to let you know that this video is part of a larger course called Operating Systems 101 on CyberTrainingPro.com. So if you enjoy the content, you want to see the rest of the course, or you want to see other courses that we have or our career services, make sure to check out CyberTrainingPro.com. I'll leave a link in the description so you can check it out. All right, let's get started. So to get the ISO for Windows Server, we're going to go to Google and we're going to search for Windows Server ISO. And we're going to select Windows Server 2022 because that's the latest version of Windows Server. And we're going to select download the ISO because we're going to install a local virtual machine. All right, so you do have to fill out this form here on the right side of the screen to get your ISO file download. So go ahead and fill that out. All right, so once you fill that out, you'll be taken to the Evaluation Center download page and then you can select your ISO. I'm gonna do English United States. One other thing that I'll say too is I tried this in a few different browsers and some work, some don't. So you might have to try a different browser if it's not redirecting you to the right page. But I'm gonna go ahead and click the ISO download and then I'm gonna let that download and once we have that ISO file, we'll be able to set it up. So now I have the server ISO file, so I'm going to open up VMware Workstation Pro and I'm gonna to go to file, new virtual machine. We're gonna do a typical installation and hit next. We need to browse to the ISO file. So we'll select the ISO file and select open. And then we'll select next. Just like with Windows 11, it wants us to enter in a Windows product key. We're not gonna do that. It's basically gonna put us into an evaluation period for the operating system. And that's totally fine for our use. You can select the version of the operating system that you wanna use. There's data center and standard. Basically, there's a difference in feature sets that you can use. It's not really gonna affect the functionality that we're gonna do or main kind of operations like domain controllers and things like that. So don't worry about that. But you do have a core version and a GUI version. So the core version is basically the command line version. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna do the data center version with the GUI. Then it wants you to create a username. So we're gonna do just like we did before and we're gonna do a local admin account here. And we'll enter in a password and we're gonna select next. Because you didn't enter a product key, Windows will install one without it and you can activate it later. Would you like to continue? We're gonna select yes. Okay, go ahead and give it a name and then select where you want to store it. Okay, and then hit next. Now you need to specify the disk capacity, so how much you wanna be able to store on the hard drive. We're gonna leave it as the default 60 gigabytes, and then you can create a single file for your virtual machine or virtual disk, or you can split it up into multiple files. We're gonna split it up into multiple files, that's the default, and hit next. Then you can customize your hardware if you want. We're going to go into the menu here, and we're gonna give it a little bit more RAM just so it's a little bit more powerful computer. Now you can configure other things in here too if you want, but we're not going to. We're gonna hit close. And then if you have this checkbox checked, it is going to power on the virtual machine once it is created. So we're gonna hit finish. All right, so this is a pretty common error where it can't find the software license terms. So we're gonna hit okay on this, and we're actually gonna shut down this virtual machine. So we'll shut down the guest and we're gonna to go to edit virtual machine settings. We're gonna to go to the floppy drive and we're actually gonna turn this off so it's not gonna connect at power up. And we're gonna select okay. Then we're gonna power the virtual machine back on. For some reason, I don't know why that works, but that is the solution to the problem because as you can see now, we do have the dialog box to actually install the operating system. So very, very strange but we're gonna install it with English United States. Time and currency format's gonna be English United States. And the keyboard or input method is gonna be US. We're gonna select next, and we're gonna select install now. Now, if you remember when we were setting up the virtual machine, it did ask us which version we wanna install. So it's really weird that it doesn't carry that over, but you can see in here that there are different versions here. So we're gonna do the data center evaluation and we're gonna do the desktop experience because we want the actual desktop GUI just like we're on a normal system. And we'll select next. We're gonna to agree to the terms. So we'll check the checkbox and hit next. Now you can upgrade if you already have an install of Windows on that system. We don't, this is a brand new virtual machine, brand new hard drive. So we're gonna do this custom installation here. You can see we only have one partition on here. 
We'll make sure that's selected and we'll hit next. All right, so we'll let this run through the installation process and when this is complete, we'll check back in. We'll go ahead and restart the computer. All right, so by default, this is actually gonna create us a built-in administrator account that we can use for local administration. So we can't change the username, but it does want a password for it. We'll hit finish. And we need to go ahead and log in here. So with virtual machines, you do have the ability to send a control alt delete because that's typically what's going to allow you to log in or do some of those functionalities. So just make sure you understand how to send that to the system. So go ahead and type in your password. And then now it's gonna log us in for the first time. Because this is a lab environment computer, I am actually going to allow other computers on the network to discover this system. So I'm gonna hit yes. Typically, you wouldn't really want to do that in a lot of cases, but again, because this is a lab system, that's why we're going to do that. Are you tired of overpaying for cybersecurity training? Are you interested in training from industry professionals? Are you looking for cybersecurity career services? If you answered yes to any of those questions, then CyberTrainingPro.com is the perfect platform for you. At CyberTrainingPro, we're a one-stop shop for all your cybersecurity needs. We can train you for industry certifications or just improve your overall knowledge and skills in a certain area. Unlike other platforms, we don't stop there. We can also coach you throughout your career, practice your interview skills, or create a high-performing resume with our career services. CyberTrainingPro.com isn't just another training platform. Students get exclusive access to our private community where we go beyond training courses to provide additional content, tips and tricks, and engagement with both other students and staff. Look. By the year 2025, there could be as many as 3.5 million job openings in cybersecurity. With so much opportunity, why not maximize your career potential with a platform that cares about your success? Come join us at CyberTrainingPro.com and start building your future today. So now we've logged into the server for the first time. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to start, type update, and then check for updates. And we're going to select check for updates. We're checking for the latest updates because of cybersecurity and because best practices. We're not going to try to break into this system. So we actually want it to be as secure as possible, just like it would be in the real world. And we're going to go ahead and restart the computer now. All right. So we're going to insert the control alt delete again and type in our password. Right. And one thing that's different with servers is sometimes if you have to restart them or shut them down or anything like that, you might get this dialog box and then it just has you put in a reason why that happened. So we're just going to say ignore and hit OK. And then now we have a fully updated server version of Windows Server 2022. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a snapshot. So we're going to go to VM and then snapshot and take snapshot. So I typically will put the date and then fresh install, fully updated. And then I also put user information in here. That way if I ever have to go back, I have the information stored in the snapshot. So I'm gonna hit take snapshot and that is saving the state. So you can see in the lower left here, saving state. So that is creating the snapshot. So snapshots are great if you ever have to go back to a certain state of the virtual machine because it takes basically a full backup of a point in time. So any data, any configurations, anything like that that you have set up on that system, it's going to create a backup of that point. And so again, later if something happens and you need to go back to this original snapshot, or if you take more snapshots along the way, then you can restore those snapshots. So of course you can change the resolution or anything else that you need to do to get it to match your environment and how you want to operate with it. So I'm going to actually change the resolution here to match my screen size and then keep changes. And there you have it. Our installation of Windows Server 2022 is done and just make sure that your snapshot finishes so that you have that backup copy and you're ready to go. Okay, so one final thing that I wanna point out is on your server installation, you should change the name of that server 
to something that reflects its function or its place within your enterprise. So we're gonna go to Server Manager, and we're gonna go to Local Server here on the left, and you'll see that you get a bunch of different settings and properties of your system. First one's computer name, so let's go ahead and click on that. Then let's go ahead and click on change to change the name. Now again, this should reflect what it does within your network. As you can see, a computer name that it assigned automatically means absolutely nothing to us. Now, this can come in real handy if you have a good naming convention within your enterprise so you can easily distinguish what a server or a system does. Okay, this is the name that I'm gonna use for this system on this network. I'm gonna hit okay. And it's gonna make us restart the computer to apply the changes. We'll hit okay. And something else that I want you to keep in mind is there is a link restriction on that computer name. So you can't make it super long. But if you make it too long, the system will actually notify you that you've put in too many characters and then you'll have to change it. So for some reason that didn't force a restart. So we're just gonna force a restart and let it do its thing and apply those changes to the computer name. Okay, so now we're logged back in. We're gonna go to local server in the server manager and we can see that the name has been changed for this server. If you change the functionality of the server so it's starting to do something else than intended, then you wanna change that name as well. Or if you clone the virtual machine, then you're gonna to wanna to change the name also. So just keep that in mind and change your name if you have to.